Today's tutorial is about Mops Plus Trigger Falloff. This is a solver that measures the time at which an attribute crosses some boundary and lets you use that time for all kinds of other effects like fading or incrementing over time. Mops Trigger Falloff also records some other useful attributes from the solver that you can optionally export to your points. You can store a Boolean-like triggered attribute that turns from 0 to 1 the moment as object is triggered. You can also store the exact frame at which an object is triggered in the simulation. Finally, you can store the time elapsed since the object was triggered. These values can be used to drive more complex effects. For example, you can use the time elapsed attribute along with mops set sequence time to drive the animation of instances using a single animated falloff. Okay, as always, we're going to start with a really simple example. I'm going to drop down a geometry container and then make a grid. And I'm going to use the points of this grid to drive this trigger example. So I'm going to add a few more points by setting this to be 50 by 50. And now what I want to do is take a mop shape fall off and sweep it across this grid. And I'm going to do it relatively quickly so that we can get kind of a dynamic wave effect. So I'm going to enable preview fall off. And what I want to do is have this value sweep from 0 to 1, so purple to white, uh, across about the first second of this animation. So at frame 1, I'm going to keyframe the position here. And then again at frame 24, I'm just going to sweep this entirely across so the whole thing is white. Key that. And then maybe in the middle here, just make this more interesting. I'm going to add a little bit of noise. And now we get this kind of uh, sweeping effect going across. So next, we're going to drop down the trigger fall off. And what this is going to do is measure the time at which mops fall off crosses a certain threshold. So by default, the trigger attribute under the trigger tab here is mops fall off. And this means that that's the attribute that it's going to be watching. The fall off attribute is the output attribute, uh, which also is set to mops fall off. So this is going to overwrite the existing attribute when we do this. Um, the threshold is the value that it's looking for, and the comparison is greater than. And that means that by default, the moment that mops fall off crosses 0 0.1, it's going to fire the trigger. What I want to do is have this fire the trigger uh, when this when it turns white, essentially. So what I'm going to do is set this to be 0.99 and leave the tr comparison at greater than. And that means that when the fall off more or less is 1.0 and it turns completely white, that's when the trigger is going to fire. If I enable preview fall off for this, you can see right away that uh, the leading edge all of a sudden is white here, and then you get this fading effect over time. That fade is driven by the elapsed time range and the time ramp here. So the time range basically says, uh, what is the start and end frame uh, for the fade effect or the time ramp effect to happen? The start frame here is when it's triggered, and then this is sort of how many frames after the trigger happens does the fade stretch for. So, for example, right now it's default 48, sec uh, 48 frames, and so that means that exactly two seconds after something is triggered, it's going to fade to zero. And so you can see that, like, here's our, here's our first second, here's our second second, and then by three seconds in, after the trigger, everything is, is completely zero. And we can adjust this if we want a faster or slower fade effect. So if I want this to only fade over one second, I can set this to 24, and now we get a much quicker fade. Something important to pay attention to, to is this might be hard to see until we actually copy something to these points, but there is a little bit of banding. So let's just uh, let's make this easier to see. We're going to make a box, give it some vertex normals, and then use a copy to points. We're going to copy boxes to all these points, make sure that these are packed and instanced. And then when we show this, let's, uh, let's make these a bit smaller. I'm just going to use a quick use a point wrangle if I want to, and just set these things initial scale to be about 0.2. And now these are boxes that are just about the right size. Um, so let's use this fall off value to set the transform. We use a mops transform modifier. And I am going to scale these guys down to zero. And this is actually giving us the opposite effect that we want. So real quick, I can use a mops remap fall off and just invert these values and set the output to one from zero to one to one to zero. And now we have the opposite effect. And now you'll be able to see this maybe a little bit more clearly. You can see that there's some color banding going on in this solve, and that means we have a limited amount of resolution to work with. What we can do to solve that is, because this is a fairly quickly moving solve, we just need to go back to our trigger falloff, go to the solver settings, and then increase our sub-steps. Let's do something like three for this. If we reset the simulation, it'll recompute, and now you can see that the color is a little bit smoother going in, and this means that we have a little bit more room to play with the shape of the trigger, and it means that we won't have any visible banding uh, when we do the animation on the falloff here.
So for example, I can go back to the trigger falloff, and because the solve is already done here, uh, I can edit this time ramp in the elapsed range after the fact, and I won't have to recompute anything. So I could drag this back and maybe add a bit of a leading edge to this thing. And you can see, like, when I animate this up and down, that it changes the, the forward shape of this thing. Uh, and that's, again, that's based on the elapsed time range. So starting at zero, this leading edge here is exactly when the trigger goes off. Uh, and this is the end of it. And so now I can kind of shape this into being some kind of, you know, maybe a maybe just a very slight leading edge to this thing so I get a more interesting organic shape. Let's just scrub that back and forth. Yeah, okay. And now we get this uh, this fade effect tailing off over just a second. But again, we can change this range without modifying anything else upstream and recalculating. So if we want this to be a much quicker wave, we can just do it like this. Maybe Maybe just 10 or 11 frames. And now we get this nice quick sweep. Okay, now it's time for a more advanced example. Uh, this is going to be about animating instances, and so the first thing I want to do is bake out a simple animation. I'm going to use a built-in walk cycle. So I'm just going to drop down an object network real quick, and then inside there, a uh, mocap biped one. The object network is just to keep this all sort of self-contained inside a single SOP network. Sometimes it's easier for organization. Either way, we don't need to change this. This is just a default white walk cycle. And his cycle is about 26 frames on the dot from start to finish. So we're going to remember that number, jump back up to our geometry network, and then I'm going to object merge that geometry into this scene. So to do that, let's just uh, grab object net, mocap biped, and then scroll down to geo, and we're just going to grab all of this. And so now we have him in SOPs. Uh, and all we have to do at this point is just write to Alembic. So I'm going to use the ROP Alembic output SOP. And we can just set the frame range to the same as his walk cycle. So 1 to 25. We don't want uh, frame 26 because that's the same as the first frame. So we'll just render 1 through 25 and then write this to disk. Now that that's done, we can load this Alembic back in. I'm just going to set it to be that same thing that we just exported. And let's turn on the display flag, and okay, there he goes. So just one cycle, and then he stops at frame 25. Next thing to do is to instance him. So I'm going to drop down a mops instancer, and let's just make a quick line of these guys. So I'm going to stick with the grid distribution, but then let's change the uh, fixed size here to be, let's do this by 10, and then change our step to be 1 and 1. And so now we have this line here of about 10 guys. Next up, we're going to use another shape falloff to sort of sweep the falloff across. So right now, these guys are all moving in exactly the same way, and they just sort of cycle here endlessly. But what we want to do is uh, is have them triggered by a certain attribute. So we'll use a mop shape falloff like before. And let's enable preview falloff here. And we're going to start at 0 and then sweep across to 1. So I'm going to set a keyframe here, and then let's say one second in, I'm going to set another one where they're all white, and we'll use that as our trigger attribute. So next up is the trigger falloff. Now for this, I don't really care uh, what number is triggering it. I'm just going to use 0.1 to keep it simple. So the moment the trigger, if the falloff value incoming is above zero, that's when the trigger is going to fire. But what I do want to do differently is I want to go to the Attributes tab here, and I want to enable Keep Attributes. And these three attributes are important. The, the one that we're going to use here is the Elapsed Attribute, but we also have Triggered and Trigger Time. Triggered is just a 0 to 1 attribute that says this object has been triggered. If we go over on the spreadsheet here and watch this happen, we can see that they go from 1 to 0 uh, over the course of this animation. Trigger Time starts at negative 1, which is sort of a default saying this has not been triggered yet. Uh, and then it stores the exact time in frames at which each of these things is triggered over time. Uh, as far as the actual falloff attribute, we don't care for this because the, the, the most important thing is the elapsed attribute, which is over here, and this is telling us how many frames have elapsed since we fired that trigger, and that's what we can use to drive the animation. So to do that, we're going to use mop set sequence time. And this can take any of these attributes incoming and use it to actually set the index of each of these animated objects. So I don't need to change the cycling mode or the Alembic range because all that's already handled for us. 
Uh, but what I do want to do is set the index type. Instead of expression, I just want to use an attribute. And that attribute is just going to be elapsed. And now if I scrub back to the beginning, you can see that they start walking one at a time, and they're all actually offset from each other. And now they'll just sort of cycle indefinitely. Now, you may or may not be able to see these guys walking on your system. Uh, the viewport is a little bit notorious for not showing off time offset sequences correctly. So if you're seeing something weird, especially if you have a lot of primitives, maybe not a ton because you'll break your system if you unpack, but the unpack stop is the best way to double check and make sure that your instances are an actually animating the way that you think they are. So if the viewport is acting a little bit weird when you're doing this time offset stuff, Use an unpack SOP, double check, uh, and it should line up with what's actually happening. And you don't need to leave this unpack in here if you're, uh, if you're rendering. It's just for viewport display. Most render engines are going to be able to see these sequences and render them correctly. Uh, whether or not they'll instance efficiently is up for debate. Depends on your render engine. But they will render correctly or should. Um, so you don't, you don't need to leave this unpack on the display. You just need that there for testing. So I would set it back here for rendering. And that's really all there is to this node. You can see it's you know it's fairly simple, but uh, it opens up a lot of options for creating interesting and dynamic movement. Thanks for watching, and see you again soon.